him bear some fruit in our lives and to show our love for him and just really continue the worship of what we're going to do. We're going to be talking about Matthew chapter 25, and I am going to refer to uh, Zacchaeus. Lori and I had the opportunity in our 36 years of marriage to disciple a lot of people and to get an opportunity to show that love of God for people. And, um, and the lately, I've been able to minister with Ronnie Molina over at Grace Church and uh, work with him over the past four years. And then the Lord seemed to lead us over here to Grace Fellowship. And we look forward to uh, what he's going to do in our lives in here. Have a seat. Uh, no, I don't think so, but thanks. Now, if you look here, I want the Lord's benefit for all of us, okay? So if we do that, let's have a word of prayer before we start. Dear Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving to us, Lord, your spirit. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the reason that we gather here today. We pray, God, that your blessing would be on each one of us to, to have a clear understanding of what you have provided for us and what you want us to accomplish for your glory. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, we are going to talk about Matthew 25, and uh, we're going to talk about probably the whole chapter, a little bit of that chapter. But the first thing I want to notice is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, we all know the story how he went up into the tree and the Lord came along and he says, I need to go to your house today. He went to his house. And we see when Zacchaeus says, look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. When you read that statement, you're seeing the repentance of a man who has believed in Jesus Christ. So many times we major on the decision to accept Christ as our Savior, and we believe in him as our Lord and Savior. But John told us that we need to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. And if you take a look at Zacchaeus' life, what we see there is his decision to accept Christ as his Messiah, because we're before the cross, but then as he accepts him as his Messiah, his life changes dramatically to the point where he's willing to give half of his goods to the poor. He takes action. He takes action as a result of what he believes. Now, if you look at Matthew 25, there are a couple of parables there, the parable of the ten virgins, and then you have the parable of the talents. When you look at the ten virgins, five of them were wise and prepared. Five of them were considered foolish. I'm not sure this thing's working. Oh, i got to turn it on. Sorry. Okay. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. Now the five that were wise had their lamps full, they were waiting. The other five ran out of oil and they asked for oil. And the other five told them, well, go to the market and buy. When you look at the five who had their lamps full, they were people who were prepared. They were people who took responsibility for themselves. They were people who said, I've got a lamp. You know, the bridegroom is going to come, and I want to be ready for when he comes, so I'm going to make sure my lamp's full, and I'm going to make sure that when he comes, that I can go in. The foolish, I don't know what was on their mind, but regardless of what was on their mind, they weren't ready. They didn't take responsibility for themselves. They didn't go out, they didn't buy the oil, they didn't have their lamps full, they were not ready and it was their fault. You look at the, the talents, and that was a lot of money that was given to these gentlemen. And there was an expectation of production. These men were proactive, all except for one. They went out, 
and they took what they had that God had given them, their master had given them, they went out and made more. They were proactive. They made sure that they took what their master gave them and it produced something. We see the virgins, we see responsibility. We see someone taking responsibility for their own actions, for their own life, and fulfilling the event and enjoying it. We see the guys with the talents, a lot of money given to them, they were proactive, they invested it, they made it go to work for them, and they were rewarded for that production. We see Zacchaeus spontaneously responding in faith to Christ, beginning to take action in his life. We look at Jesus in Acts 1.1. All that Jesus began both to do and teach. You know, that same Luke wrote in Luke 22, he wrote, Jesus, quoting Jesus, the things concerning me have an end. You know, we begin with Jesus. And that's our beginning. And then we come to the end. We have an end also. And our end is really the be a new beginning for eternity. In Matthew 25, we look at Jesus coming back. He's been talking about his, the future events in the world. He says, when the Son of Man comes. Luke called him the Son of Man. Jesus many times referred to himself as the Son of Man. We're familiar with this term, those of us who've been in church for a long time. The Son of Man, that's the same Son of Man who uh, healed the blind, walked on water, fed the 5,000, was at the beach when his disciples were out on the boat and he prepared breakfast for them and cooked for them and said, come and dine. This is the same Jesus who fell asleep in the boat because he was so tired and his disciples woke him up and he calmed the sea and they were so amazed that he had power over the creation. This was a private, intimate meeting between Jesus and his disciples. You can see that in Matthew 24, 3. A private, intimate meeting. Jesus is talking to them about future events. And when he comes to the end of all that he's talked about, he's talking about himself coming in glory. Now the Son of Man, when he comes in his glory, you think about the Mount of Tran uh, Transfiguration, and Jesus was there with Peter, James, and John. When Peter saw the glory of Christ, he was so moved that he said, we've got to build some tabernacles here. We've got to, we've got to get up and we've got to get moving. Now that fits the theme of what we're talking about, right? Zacchaeus, he got busy, he, he went out and he says, I've got to do this. I've got to give up half of my goods to the poor. We see, um, we see the, the uh, virgins preparing their lamps, being ready, taking responsibility for themselves. We see the men who were given the talents, and they're out there proactively making that money produce something for their master's return. And then we see Peter, he's busy too. But then there's a cloud that overshadows Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that cloud, when it overshadows Jesus, the voice says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. The problem with Peter's activity is, is that he was misdirected, misguided, misunderstanding. He had an error, a flaw in what he was doing. His heart was in the right place. I, he wanted to do something that would honor the situation. But the father says, this is my beloved son, hear him, hear him. Don't get busy with stuff that doesn't matter. Hear what Jesus is directing you to do. You know, when he sits on his glory, that's going to be the thronos, it's not the bema seat. The bema seat you can see in Romans, um, chapter 14, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the Bema Seat. And also 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15 talks about God's judgment on his children. The judgment seat of Christ. Now, this event has a lot of controversy about it. Some call it the great white throne. Some call it the Bema Seat. But if you look in the context of what the Bible is talking about here, you're talking about the end of the tribulation period. You're talking about a time when Jesus has come back to earth. He's mounted his white horse. He has ridden back. If you read the passages, and, uh, and we don't really have time to go into it, but Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Zechariah talks about what he is going to do to Basra. What's going to happen in the valley of decision? We know and all of us are familiar with the phrase, blood up to the horse's bridles. That's all going to happen before this event, probably. So you look at Jesus, the nations are gathered before him. The sheep are taken to one side, the goats are taken to the other side. And when he takes a look at the sheep and he takes a look at the goats, he presses his attention at the sheep. Verse 34, he says, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It's something that has been anticipated. It's something that's been looked forward to. And Jesus is ready to give it away. Now, if you notice in these verses, you don't really see anything talking about... Now, Jesus had mentioned his death to his disciples before. He had mentioned his resurrection to his disciples before. But in this passage, you don't see him talking about his death. You don't see him talking about his resurrection. You don't see him talking about being lifted up. The focus in this passage is in what the people did. What did they do? And if you look at this, when he says, Come blessed into the kingdom, inherit it. It's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Because for, verse 35, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Food, clothing, taking time out for someone else. And the righteous, now that word righteous is the only indication we have that these people are believers. Because the only way we become a believer is through the righteousness that God is willing to give us in Jesus Christ. Now during the tribulation period, the gospel is going to be preached. God is going to allow the gospel to be preached. People are going to die for the gospel. We do not know how much Bible knowledge is really going to be available during the tribulation period. But we see these people, verse 38, they respond. After Jesus says all that, they say, Lord, when? When did we see you that way? They don't even know, really, the bottom line fundamental purpose of what they were doing. They were living the love that God had given them. Just like Zacchaeus, when he spontaneously responded to Jesus being Messiah in his life. When the virgins got ready and took responsibility for their life and said, hey, I'm, we're going to be ready. When the men who had the talents, they received those talents and they got busy and they said, we are going to produce something. We're not going to fool around. So it's sad that the one who did fool around got his talent taken away from him and then it was given to the most productive one. When did we see you? And he says, hey, verse 40. Well, he didn't really say hey. He says, the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, as much as you did it to one of the least, of these my brethren, you did it to me. 
we think about Jesus' identity, that it is so tied to his children that when he sees his children, he sees himself. And when he looks at you and he looks at me and he sees someone ministering to you, someone ministering to me, or seeing us minister to anyone else, when the final judgment bottom line word of God comes to us, you did it for me. You did it to me. You helped me. You know, there's going to be some goats there. They're going to be surprised also. When didn't we help you? When did we see you and we didn't help you? When were we aware of something going on? You know, when did we see you? He said, well, you didn't do it for me. You didn't do it for them. You didn't do it for me. A lot of people are doing a lot of good works in the world. But the motivation isn't necessarily Jesus Christ. Just like when Peter was on the mountain of transfiguration, he got all excited about doing something. But it wasn't in the right motive, for the right reason, for the right cause. It was because he had a mistaken audible. You know, in football, you know, the quarterback will be ready with the football, and he sometimes gives an audible after they've been in the huddle. And if you don't hear the audible, you're not going to go the right direction in the play. And the problem with Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration was his audible was all messed up. And God the Father tried to straighten him out. He said, this is my beloved son here, him. We look at this event, it's an international event. There's a distinction made among humanity that supersedes race. This isn't about ethnicity, this is about decision making. The reward has been anticipated for a very long time and it is going to be given away. And the reward is based on what they do because of who they are. Now when you think about Genesis, you go back to Genesis, chapter 15, chapter 12 really, God made a promise to Abraham. He promised him land. In chapter 15, he promised him an heir. In chapter 18, the birth was actually announced when it was going to happen. Chapter 21, the child was born. Chapter 22 is when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son. I want you to go to a place where I'll tell you and offer him as a burnt offering. Genesis 22. Now Abraham, when he heard that promise in Genesis 15, verse 6, the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God. He heard what God had to say. And he says, I believe it. And God gave him righteousness. Just really the way when we believe in Jesus Christ, God gives us his righteousness and qualifies us for eternity by that faith in Jesus Christ. We recognize he died on the cross. We recognize that he rose from the dead. We believe that he's telling us the truth and we accept it, we believe it, and God says, okay, you're righteous. And we're prepared for eternity. Abraham made a decision similar to that. But then in Genesis 22, God told him to take his son, his only son, take him up to a mountain, offer him as a sacrifice, and Abraham immediately went to work and started the process. He took his son up, put him on the altar, was ready to kill him, and all of a sudden they stayed his hand, there was a ram in the thicket, and God said, I swear by myself, because you have done this thing, 
that in blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. God did not say in Genesis chapter 15, I swear by myself because you have made this decision. Now it's true, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. He had everything that he needed. But when what we see what God wants, really, we see it in Genesis 22, when God responds to Abraham's act of faith, and he says, I swear by myself, you are going to get what I promised you because you did this. You took your son to the mountain. You offered him as a sacrifice. It's a done deal. Now, the danger in all that is to say, Terry, uh, are you going towards work salvation? Are you saying that the work of Jesus isn't enough? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace are you saved by faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. When we get faith, it comes to us because of the influence of God's word. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The influence of the word provokes faith in us and then we respond as a sheep or a goat, yea or nay. But then when we respond to that, God recognizes our faith and he says, they are believing in my provision. I will give them that righteousness. I am going to make them a child of God. But that's not the whole story. Yes, by faith we have been saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. We are his, not of uh, works, lest any man should boast, because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God ordained beforehand that we should do them. When we really demonstrate ourselves to be children of God is not when we make a decision for Christ. Yes, that is important. Yes, we need to believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. But when we come to the judgment seat of Christ God is going to say oh you made a decision but he's going to focus on what we did what we did isn't going to save us what we did is going to be the evidence that we really are a child of God you see when Jesus came he had evidences that proved that he was the son of God. He healed the blind. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He rose from the dead. He had evidences to his disciples as to who he was. When we believe, he had a name. He says, I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. But he didn't just say it. He proved it. And when we make our decision for Christ, our evidence is, is the way we live. Our proof in the pudding is what we do. Our responsibility, our proactivity, how we respond to all these messages that we have heard all of our lives. Someday there is going to be a culmination and we are going to stand before Jesus and Jesus is going to look at us and he's going to say, you were serving me and you didn't even know it. Now it's different in our day because we have so much information. We're in the church age. We have so much information. Thousands of messages are being preached. 
hundreds and hundreds of pages are being published every day. You turn on your radio, you turn on your TV, you can find the gospel if you want to. We don't really have much excuse. Those people, when they come before Christ, they're going to say, when? May, who knows, maybe the book of Matthew, maybe they weren't, isn't going to be available during the tribulation. I don't know, probably so. But for some reason, they're going to be ignorant. You know, when we think of all these people and all that they did and how they lived in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, it was all about what they did. It was all about what they did. And just like everything else in life, the judgment is not based in what we say we believe, but what we do because we believe. What we do. The judgment shows us three main needs in life, and those are the needs of life we need to be sensitive to. You say, well, is that all we're supposed to do? Well, of course not. We share Christ as we do these things so that people know where we're coming from. I mean, we're a different class of people than what we were studying about in Matthew 25. We have a message. We have an understanding. We know who we're talking about. And people do what they are. People do what they are. You know, the thing about ignorance, it can't necessarily help you, but it can definitely hurt you. I always think about the first person who walked across a frozen river. The very first person who came up and saw a frozen river and he, and he stuck his foot out on it. He went, hmm. He's wondering, and he looks across, I, I gotta get over there. And so he takes a step and he says, hmm. Yeah, seems okay to me. And he starts to walk across. And he's walking across and and really, you know, because of how it felt at the edge, you know, he's really not scared. And he walks along, and all of a sudden, you've all heard the ice give, haven't you? And he hears that sound, and he feels himself sink. And, and, and then he begins to have a little apprehension. And then all of a sudden, the ice gives way, and he's under the ice, and he's drowned. Ignorance can't necessarily help you, but it can definitely hurt you. We can't live a fatalistic life. We can't live a life of mysticism. We can't live a life of ecstatic experiences. Uh oh, I really need to go back, Tim. I missed this. One. Sorry, guys. Thanks. We cannot live our lives based on ecstatic experiences and, and meditation. I mean, that's why they built uh, monasteries and things like that. But you know what we've got? We've got a life that God has given us. We've got abilities that we can use. God has blessed us with a lot of information and intelligence. I mean, you think about it. The, before the Reformation, people were lucky if someone read the Bible to them. Notice what Proverbs 9, 10 to 12 says. For by me, your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. Look at this next phrase, this phrase. The me in that is wisdom. That's not talking, it says, for by me, wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and, and, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But notice wisdom, and notice that phrase, if. If you are wise, 
you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. You think back to the sheep and the goats. He welcomed the sheep. He cursed the goats. They were refused. Ignorance didn't matter. If you're wise, you're going to be wise for yourself. If I'm looking to buy something and, and there's a limited quantity, if I don't get there in time, I'm losing out. I've got to prepare. I've got to think. I've got to know. And God is giving us, through the preaching of the word, those opportunities to think, to know, and decide. And if I'm wise then I'm wise for my benefit. And if I'm wise for my benefit, others can benefit from the wisdom that I have. If I share it. I hope this message hasn't been too aggressive for you. Because we have to realize that God has an expectation for us to be in his image. And God is a responsible God. God is a proactive God. God is an active God. And God is spontaneous. And we can be that way too. If you don't know Jesus, this is your opportunity to know him. And you can begin that path of love and joy that, that we're all really enjoying right here who know him. And I hope you can make that a part of your life if it isn't. Let's have a word of prayer and then if the guys can come. Dear Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving to us. We thank you for sharing. Oh Lord, we God, we want to be your children. We want to be the light that you have given us to be. We want to enjoy that fellowship with you and rejoice in who you are, God. We thank you that you created this world, that you gave us opportunity to love you, that you have shared with us your purpose to seek and to save that which was lost, and, and then gave us the promise that you are coming back. And Lord, we look forward to you coming back. Oh Lord, we believe in your coming. And we want our lives be shaped by your reality, God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.